is one of the strongest proofs that the Bible is the Word of God. Think about it. Prophecy is not found in the Koran. It's not found in the Book of Mormon. It's not found in the writings of Christian science or the writings of Hinduism. But prophecy actually makes up one-third of the Bible. Listen to this. Author Wilbur Smith wrote, Whatever one may think of the authority of and the message presented in the book we call the Bible, there is worldwide agreement that in more cases than one, it is the most remarkable volume that has ever been produced in these some 5,000 years of writing on the part of the human race. It is the only volume ever produced by man or a group of men in which is to be found a large body of prophecies relating to individual nations, to Israel, to all the peoples of the earth, to certain cities, and to the coming of one who was to be the Messiah. Now, one of the most amazing studies you can do is study the prophecies of Jesus Christ, the studies of the Messiah. It's amazing because there's not just a few. There's hundreds of them. And they were all fulfilled to the letter. And they were written hundreds of years before him. Well, let's look this morning. We'll take a few moments. and Let's look at the Bible's prophecies of the Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we go through this, ask yourself this question. Who wrote the Bible? There can only be one answer. Well, let's begin at the beginning because that's where we see the first prophecy of Christ. Would you turn to Genesis chapter 3, please? Let's begin right at the very beginning. In Genesis 3, we get our first prophecy of Christ. And as we get to Genesis 3, we're going to go down to verse 15. Adam has fallen into sin, and God is going to pronounce his judgment upon the man, the woman, the serpent. And then he says this to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right? And of course, he's making this statement to Satan himself. But here's the first promise of the Savior. Jesus will reconcile us to God at a very painful cost to himself. And Jesus is the seed of the woman. Now, isn't that interesting? Think about it. Women don't have seed, right? Seed of a man, but not the seed of a woman. What is this? Well, I think this is the first glimpse we get of the virgin birth. And so it all begins in Genesis. There man falls into sin, becomes separated from God, and there God promises man a Savior. Now, there are more, but... Let's just look at one more prophecy in the book of Genesis. One more prophecy about Jesus. Now let's go all the way to, to Genesis 49. Genesis chapter 49. And I call your attention to verse 10, okay? Genesis 49 and verse 10. It says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Now, Shiloh is another, another word for Messiah. Until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Here we're told that the Messiah king would come from the lineage of Judah. One of Jacob's 12 sons. The Messiah wouldn't just be Jewish. He would come from a particular tribe of Israel. And remember, in Revelation, Jesus is called the Lion from the tribe of Judah. So we have a very interesting prophecy there of the Messiah. And he would come from the very lineage of Judah, one of Jacob's 12 sons. Well, now let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, please. 
2 Samuel chapter 7. And there God makes a promise to David. A king, a king would come from him whose kingdom would have no end. All right, 2 Samuel 7. Look at verse 12 and verse 13. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. He's talking about David. David, after you're dead. He says this, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The everlasting rule of the Lord Jesus Christ is prophesied here. And that's a great, great prophecy concerning the everlasting rule of our Lord and Savior. Well, now let's go to the book of Job, all right? And look at, I think, a, a really blessed prophecy given to us by Job. Job chapter 19, if you would. Job chapter 19. In this chapter, we have the resurrection of our bodies prophesied of. And let's see who's going to raise us. Go down to verse 25. Job chapter 19. And let's look at verse 25. Job said this, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job tells us that in the last days, Jesus will return and raise the dead. Bodies that have been eaten by worms shall be made new and see their wonderful Redeemer. Isn't that glorious? Now, one night after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his apostles, and he said this in Luke 24, verse 44. He said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, concerning me well we've seen some of the things that Moses wrote now let's see what's written in the prophets and in the Psalms about Jesus first of all let's see what's written in the Psalms about Jesus let's go to one of the most amazing sections of Scripture when it comes to prophecy I'm talking about Psalm 22 let's turn over to Psalm 22 I can still remember the first time I read Psalm 22 after I was saved. I was, I was literally blown away by what I read. There in Psalm 22, I saw the crucifixion of Jesus 1,000 years before it took place. Let's look at this Psalm. Look at verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Jesus uttered those very words. And they teach us that on the cross, the Father forsook the Son as he bore upon himself the sins of the whole world. And when Jesus quoted that, he was saying, I want you to know I am fulfilling what was written about me in Psalm 22. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. 
They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. As Jesus hung on the cross, the crowd mocked him and laughed at him. Psalm 27, or rather Matthew 27, verse 43 says, He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Let's read now verses 14 through 18. Verse 14. Oh, look what it says. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. The horrors of his crucifixion are prophesied there. His terrible thirst, his body pulled out of joint, his hands and feet pierced by nails. As he hangs there, Roman soldiers gamble for his clothes. As I said, this is one of the most amazing sections of prophecy in the Bible. And folks, only a sin-blinded heart would deny these prophecies. Well, let's look at one more from the Psalms, all right? One more. Let's go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. And let's look at Psalm 16 and verse 10. Notice what it says. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Folks, this is an amazing prophecy concerning the death and resurrection of Christ. It says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. The word hell here means the place of the dead. It's not talking about hell, the place of fire. It's stating that God won't allow his son to stay dead. Then it says, Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. The Jews knew that when a person died, the body would begin to corrupt after three days. And this verse is declaring that God wouldn't permit Jesus Christ, the Holy One, to corrupt. God raised him on the third day. Now, someone might say, how do we really know that this verse is talking about Jesus? How do we know that? Paul tells us it is. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 13, would you? How do we know that this is written about our Lord and Savior Jesus? Well, here's what Paul said. Acts 13, please. Acts 13, and let's, let's go down to verse 34. Acts 13, and look at verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one, to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on asleep and was laid unto his fathers. 
and saw corruption, but he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Yes, this was written about Jesus. And it declares his resurrection from the dead. Well, we've seen a few things from the Psalms, what was written about him in the Psalms, and we could... <laughs> We could, we could spend hours looking at the Psalms, really, and the prophecies concerning Christ. But now, let's just look at a few things that the prophets wrote about our Lord and Savior. Think about this amazing prophecy. 700 years before Jesus was born, a man named Isaiah says he will be conceived of a virgin. So let's turn to that. You're very familiar with it, but sometimes we only look at it at Christmas. Isaiah 7, all right? Isaiah 7. And verse 14. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Isaiah wrote this. Think about it. 700 years before... Jesus came into this world. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Remember, Emmanuel literally means God with us. As I think about that verse, if you've got a Bible there and it doesn't say virgin, it says young woman, get rid of that, okay? Because the word is virgin. And just think about this. Just think about this. Would that really be a sign in Israel if a young woman conceived and bore a child? No, young women were conceiving all the time, every day. But it was a sign for a virgin to conceive and bear a son. Now, how can anyone read this and have any doubts that Jesus Christ is the prophesied Messiah and God in human form? His name is Emmanuel, God with us. I wonder how Jewish people cannot see that. Well, there's only one answer. Satanic blindness because of an unbelieving heart. How sad. Well, let's go on now to chapter 9, right? We're all familiar with chapter 9 and what it says about him. Once again, those Christmas verses. Chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This prophecy deals more with his future second coming and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. And oh, how thrilling to realize that one day the Lord Jesus will rule this world in peace. I love what verse 7 says. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Oh, peace is going to just increase, increase in the time when Jesus reigns upon this world, right? And reigns over the universe. Oh, we can't wait for that day. Now, it was also the prophet Isaiah that foretold many details about his suffering and death. Let's, let's start with Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 49. Would you turn there, please? Yes, Isaiah was also used by the Lord to prophesy many details about our Lord's suffering and his death. 
Isaiah 49 and verse 7. Now the first part of this verse tells us that Jesus will be hated and rejected by the nation of Israel. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to Him whom man despiseth, to Him whom the nation abhorreth. Think of that. And John wrote, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. How sad. And so we have right here a prophecy that when he comes to Israel, guess what? They're not going to welcome him with open arms and say, yes, this is our Messiah. No, they won't do that. They'll abhor him. They'll despise him. Next, let's go to chapter 50. Chapter 50, and we're going to look at verse 6. Isaiah 50 and verse 6. Here we read of his terrible beating and suffering at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Now, I also want you to notice something. Notice that Jesus voluntarily offered his body to be abused. Notice what it says. I gave, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. I gave, he said, folks, what love he has for you and me, right? He gave himself for you and me. He gave his body to be abused for you and me. Next, let's go to chapter 52. Chapter 52, and we're going to go down to verse 14. Isaiah 52, and let's look at verse 14. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Here we're told very graphically that because of the brutality of his suffering and crucifixion, he no longer resembled a man. People were shocked and astonished when they saw his visage, his appearance. We've seen the paintings of great painters, haven't we, of Jesus hanging on the cross, but they didn't capture his visage there. We're told in the scriptures that he was so brutalized that his visage, his appearance just shocked people, right? Once again, he, he did that. He did that because he loved us. Now let's look at what's been called the Gospel of Isaiah. I'm talking, of course, about chapter 53, okay? Often called the Gospel of Isaiah, chapter 53. And you know, this chapter basically gives us the life story of Jesus. The life story of Jesus in a nutshell. It, we won't read the whole chapter. I'll just point out a few things here. But it tells of his humble beginning, his rejection by his people in verse 1 and 2. It tells of his wonderful ministry, verse 4. He bore our griefs and sorrows. Verse 5, he was wounded and bruised for our sins. By his stripes, his wounds, we are healed. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. His soul was made an offering for sin. All of these tell us of his suffering and his death. And he did it all for us. In verse 9, in verse 9, we see his burial. It says, And he made his grave with the wicked. Remember, he died between two thieves. And with the rich. In his death, remember, he was buried in a rich man's tomb named Joseph of Arimathea. Now, in verse 10, we see his resurrection. 
Verse 10, look at the phrase, He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall prolong his days refers to his resurrection. Yes, Isaiah 53 is the gospel according to Isaiah. Next, let's look at the amazing prophecy found in Micah, chapter 5, all right? Once again, one of those Christmas passages. Can you find Micah? <laughs> He's a hard one to find, but keep looking. He's worth finding. Micah, chapter 5. And let's look at that prophecy in verse 2, as we're all very familiar with. Micah, chapter 5, and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. In other words, you're a small, obscure place, Bethlehem of Judah. Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Oh, not only will he be ruler, but what is, who is this person? Whose goings forth have been from of old, <laughs> from everlasting. Micah said the future ruler of Israel, the Messiah, would come from the obscure little village of Bethlehem. How amazing is that prophecy, huh? So many prophecies. Well, now, let's, let's just look at one more prophet. One more prophet. His name is Zechariah. Zechariah. Now, he's easy to find because the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, and he's just before Malachi, okay? The prophet Zechariah. The Lord gave Zechariah many prophecies about Jesus. Let's just look at a few of them, okay? First of all, let's go to chapter 9. Chapter 9. And we'll look at verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Look what it says here. Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Here Zechariah predicts and describes what we call Palm Sunday. Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey and the whole city sings praises to him and, and recognizes him as their Messiah. That one kind of gives me goosebumps when I look at that. We're going out to chapter 11, I will see an amazing prophecy about his betrayal and what Judas was paid. Yeah, chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 11. And let's look at verse 12 and 13. Verse 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized out of them and I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord what an amazing prophecy of Judas and his betrayal that's exactly what Judas did he got paid that 30 pieces of silver and he cast it down right there in the house of the Lord and they bought a potter's field for it huh how amazing is that well, let's go to chapter 12. We're almost out of time here. Um, chapter 12, and let's look at verse 10. Chapter 12 and verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me 
whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. At his second coming, Jerusalem and the nation of Israel will see his wounds and recognize him. The Holy Spirit will be poured out upon them and they'll believe and they'll know what they did to him and they'll mourn for him. What a glorious day that will be. Well, let's remember in Luke 24, 44, Jesus said, All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Folks, the Bible is the Word of God. And one of its greatest proofs is fulfilled prophecy. All of these prophecies have been preserved by God so that we know that we can trust in and believe the Bible. Oh, how tragic that so many hate and despise the Bible. And most of them have never read it. Oh, Christian. Your Savior was born of a virgin. He suffered terribly, and he was crucified for your sins. He was buried, and three days later, he was resurrected. He lives in heaven, and one day he's coming back, all according to prophecy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. You've recorded these things. They've been preserved for us so that we might know that the Bible truly is the Word of God. Thank you for telling us so much about our Savior, how He gave Himself for us. We love Him today, and we praise you for giving us your Word. Bless these thoughts, we pray. Bless the morning service and everyone who's coming, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.